uh, when we see something interesting out there, we'd like to, uh, to get uh, in touch with the, uh, with the authors and, and then, uh, see if they would be interested in presenting to a, uh, a smaller group. And um, Sarah Davies uh, from the University of uh, North Carolina at Chapel Hill is a, uh, has agreed to do that graciously and is going to be uh, presenting some of her recent work. Um, just a quick introduction um, uh, for Sarah. Uh, she is a uh, postdoc um, with the, uh, in marine sciences at UNC with uh, Carl Castillo. Um, her background uh, is, is quite uh, broad. She uh, did a, uh, her undergraduate work in Victoria, Canada, the University of Victoria. Um, her, her master's is in marine science at uh, University of Calgary. And excuse me, she recently completed her, her PhD uh, at the University of Texas in Austin uh, uh, um, in uh, ecology and evolutionary or evolution and behavior. I guess that's the that's the department. Excuse me, I got to take a sip of water. Thank you. Sorry about that. <clears throat> um, uh, Sarah's work is focused on. Uh, uh, largely on factors in the genetic basis of, of adaptation in the face of climate change. Um, she recently published a, um, a paper in Science with, with co-authors, um, uh, which is, I think is going to be the basis of her presentation today, uh, but she ha has a number of uh, published work in, in <coughs> excuse me again, I've got something in my throat. Sorry about that, I had a, a late lunch. Um, uh, she's, she's published in a number of top tier uh, journals, both in the field of molecular ecology, but also marine sciences and, and natural history. Uh, Sarah has a, also a strong interest in teaching um, with awards from the University of Texas um, and, and uh, training in, in interdisciplinary teaching. Um, she also teaches quantitative uh, ecological genomic methods of analysis and programming for biologists, as well as uh, teaching uh, instruction or, or or how to be an effective, uh, an effective teacher at the college level. Um, so uh, today Sarah is going to be presenting uh, her work, uh, the work of her and her some of her colleagues on the potential for uh, genetic rescue of coral reefs in, in, the, in the face of climate change, in, in particular uh, warming oceans. Um, so I think uh, I will leave it at that and, and hand, hand over the presentation to Sarah. Thank you very much, Sarah, uh, and everyone for attending. All right, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, so yeah, so I'm going to talk to you today about some of the work I've done with some colleagues at the University of Texas, at the Australian Institute of Marine Science, and Oregon State University. Um, the title of the talk today is just The Genetic Rescue of Coral Reefs from Warming Oceans. Oh, and I should ask, sorry to interrupt, Sarah, but um, if everyone could please put your uh, mute on mic, uh, your microphone on mute so that we're not interrupting, Sarah. Yes, unfortunately, given this design of the webinar, I won't be able to see people's faces. So if you're lost, I guess you'll have to keep your questions till the end. Um, but just keep track, and um, hopefully I can answer when the talk is finished. So I don't think I probably need to remind anyone that um, sea surface temperatures across the world are changing, and they're increasing. And across the coral reef range in particular, about 25 uh, south to 25 north, we're seeing increasing sea surface temperatures. So this graph here is from Mende et al. in 2009, and we see the annual sea surface temperature changes from the mean from 1988 to 2007, minus the mean from 1950 to 1969. Um, the second panel here is showing the significant changes. So anything in red means that that area of the ocean is warming, and anything in blue means it's cooling. Overall, what we can see is a lot of red, meaning that oceans worldwide are increasing in temperature. So what does this mean for corals? Uh, we know that corals are highly sensitive to these environmental changes. For example, this is some, um, some, PhD, some of my PhD work I did um, in the islands of Micronesia. This is an island um, in Yap, an area called South Tip, and this is a beautiful reef you can see covered in corals, and this was taken in 2009. We went back to sample a second species in 2010, and this is what the site looked like. So you can see um, there's no more living coral tissue, and this happened all within a year. So what this means, is that the question becomes, can corals adapt or acclimate to these changing temperatures and changing oceans, or will they stay local and suffer some sort of reduced fitness? In general, the coral response to thermal stress is what we call coral bleaching. So here we have a coral. Uh, the coral consists of a coral polyp, so a cnidarian host. 
that houses these symbiotic algae called these flagellates in the um, gastroderm here. And under a warming scenario or um, any sort of stressful scenario, what we see is the expulsion of symbiodinium or the dinoflagellate um, symbiont. And, we'll, and this can bounce back if the stress is short term and the host can um, repopulate its cells or repopulate its symbiodinium in the coral polyp, or if this is a long-term chronic stress, we see complete loss of symbiodinium, followed by the loss in the host tissue, and then the corals become covered in algae, like we saw in that picture in the last slide. So essentially, we go from corals looking like this. We see the brown color. That's the symbiotic algae living in the tissue, to something that looks more like this, where we see a bleaching event. So our main question here was, can corals adapt to increase use surface temperatures? So essentially our main question, is there variation in thermal tolerance across latitudes that might mediate some sort of genetic rescue effect through adaptation? So essentially this figure on the right here shows um, what I would call complete bleaching of a reef. So we see every coral on the reef here is bleached. But this picture here on the left, we see that one of these colonies is really bleached, but we see a lot of the colonies in the background are still housing their symbiotic algae. So this indicates that there might be some sort of variation in thermal tolerance within a reef. So that gets me to how natural selection can target a phenotype. So um, essentially, we can think of thermal tolerance as a phenotype. So if the phenotypic variation, i.e. the variation in thermal tolerance within a reef, is coded for at the DNA level, then more thermal tolerant genotypes can be selected for in the next generation. What I mean here is here we have a figure. So imagine this as being some sort of thermal tolerance value. Um, maybe it's mortality under heat or something like that, or number of algae expelled under heat. And we imagine that individuals over here are, have, have a better ability to deal with thermal stress. And this is just numbers of individuals. So we have a normal distribution. The majority of individuals have a mean thermal tolerance value, while some individuals um, on the reef have a very high thermal tolerance value. If, that, um, if this thermal tolerance is coded for at the DNA level, what we can see is a shift in the mean in the next generation. So if these individuals, if there's a bleaching event, and all of these individuals are um, selected out of the population, they all die due to thermal stress, and only these individuals are left to repopulate the reef, what we see is a shift in the mean of thermal tolerance. So what I'm talking about here is you have a bleaching event, you have a maybe increased use surface temperatures for several weeks and many of the corals die, and we have um, these corals back here that are still living, and they can repopulate the reef. So you end up with a reef full of thermal tolerance genotypes, perhaps less variation, but a mean thermal tolerance that will be higher um, than the previous generation. So before I get too further along, I want to first be very clear that this was obviously the work of many people. Um, so this was Misha Matz. Um, he's at the University of Texas. He was my PhD advisor. And this is Lena Bay. She's at the Australian Institute of Marine Science. And these are the two um, kind of co-PIs of the project. Um, Lena is really um, key to getting the corals that we worked with. And Misha is kind of the genomic power um, uh, for the project. Eli came up with, this is Eli Meyer, he's from Oregon State University. He was kind of involved in the, the development of the method that we're gonna, I'm going to be telling you about how we kind of did the mortality estimates. This is Galena, she's the um, lab tech in Misha's lab, and she was involved in doing all of the genomic library preparations. And this is Groves Dixon, he's the first author of the paper. He did a lot of the bioinformatics and a lot of the analyses you'll, you'll see me talking about today. So I just want to make sure that many people involved in this work, not just myself. So when we're talking about the genetic basis of coral thermal tolerance, um, I'll tell you a little bit of background about the experiment itself. So um, this was done in Australia, like Australia along the Great Barrier Reef, so this area here. Um, and what we have is we had a more uh, southern population, Orpheus Island. Um, this is islands a little bit cooler. And then we have the warmer area here, Princess Charlotte Bay. From now on, you'll just hear me call them PCB and OI. And essentially, these areas really differ in their um, mean monthly temperatures. So this is just looking from 2005 to 2009. But what we can see is overall, um, corals from PCB or the more northern location are, uh, experience much warmer temperatures on average than the corals from Orpheus Island. So our question now is, is there variation in thermal tolerance across latitudes? And again, this is five degrees of latitude um, that might mediate some sort of genetic rescue meaning that under climate change, if corals from cooler locations um, can't deal with thermal stress and they have a bleaching event, can corals from Princess Charlotte Bay repopulate this area? 
if they're more thermally tolerant. So the methods we, um, Lena went out with the Australian Institute of Marine Science vessel and collected colonies from Princess Charlotte Brit Bay and brought them back to Orpheus Island. We flew into Australia in November 2012 and met Lena at Orpheus Island and we collected more colonies of local corals here and then we wait for them to spawn. So this is our coral of interest, it's Acropora mellipora. It's a great, it's kind of an emerging model system for coral biology. Um, it has a genome, a transcriptome, it's got lots of um, genetic data available so it's a nice model, cool well, pseudo model organism to work on. So the first I need to tell you a little bit about the life history of these corals. So Acropora mellipora are broadcast spawning corals. So we have adults on the reef, and once they reach a large enough size, they actually partake in what's called a spawning event. So once a year, as predicted by the warmest months and certain number of days after the full moon, um, we kind of can predict that these corals will um, spawn. And what they spawn are these bundles of eggs and sperm. So it's essentially you know, six to eight eggs, it can be more or less, depending on the species, bundled up with sperm and lipids. So they're all positively buoyant from the lipid storage and they go to the surface and create what's called a spawn slick. And here's where we see fertilization occur and we get um, little larvae, these little kind of swimming planula larvae. They look kind of boring, but they're the only dispersive phase of the coral life cycle because the larvae spends um, days to months in the water column after which point it receives a cue from the emanating from the reef that tells the coral that this is a reef um, and there's a lot of research in this area as well, like settlement on the reefs, how that happens. Um, after they settle, they choose an area and they'll metamorphose into what we call a recruit. These are small little recruits um, of Acropora mellipora. And then they'll um, metamorphose and have start getting their tentacles. And then at this point, they'll start um, sequestering their symbiodinium. That's all these red dots you see on this guy. And from there, they reproduce asexually to produce the corals we see on the reef. So it's not until this point here when they sequester their symbiotidium that they start, uh, or this recruit, sorry, where they start calcifying. And then they'll reproduce asexually to produce the adults on the reef and eventually also um, partake in the broadcast spawning event. So a lot of our research was done here on these small larvae, so essentially the first three life stages of the coral here. So our crossing design. So what's really great about Acropora mellipora is that they're hermaphroditic, so they, create, they produce both eggs and sperm, but these eggs and sperm cannot self-fertilize. So what we do is the night of spawning, after we've collected all our corals, we bring them into these fancy high-tech uh, buckets, and all, what you'll see at the surface here is a little mini spawn slick, but nothing is being fertilized in this bin because it's just an individual coral um, and there's no self-fertilization. So what we go in is we go in and we collect the egg and sperm bundles from these corals, and then we separate the eggs and the sperm so we can control who the mom and who the dad are. And then we make these crosses, so um, where we know who the mom is and we know who the dad is. So what we did here is we had, uh, like I said, we had a population from Princess Charlotte Bay and a population from Orpheus Island, and it looked like this. So this symbol here is the mom. So we have four moms. We had two moms, A and B, from Orpheus Island, and two moms, C and D, from um, Princess Charlotte Bay. And then we had two dads from Orpheus Island and two moms from Princess Charlotte Bay. You'll see this diagonal here. There's no, it's not gray here because there was no crosses because you ca they cannot self-fertilize. So we cannot have a A mom with an A dad. Um, and you'll also see a couple, col a couple crosses missing here. See, there's no D A and there's no D B. Um, this colony here just kind of trickled, so we were only able to get enough eggs for a single cross, and the rest was used for sperm. Um, yeah, so this, this whole situation here, it looks really small, but um, <coughs> you're putting all your eggs in one basket, and you're hoping that all the corals go on the same night. So this part here involved us being extremely lucky to get um, both colonies from different reefs actually spawning on the same night. Um, each of these crosses was made in triplicate. And then what we um, measured was coral larval thermal tolerance. So how, essentially, like how many died uh, over time as heat. So we have, the, this is a coral, this is post-fertilization. We have the prawn chip and it goes through and it starts to become, um, has a aboral aboral end and then eventually becomes what I showed you before, this little planula larva. This is about at five days old. So this is where they're thought to start to begin to become competent to settle. So they'll start searching for substrate. Um, 
and this is it, they can swim. They're um, they're not extremely active, but they're active. Um, and we put them into these little well plates. You can actually get them online. So each little well has a net in it. So you can actually so the water kind of circulates out. So as larvae die, they're bits that may kind of uh, be bad for the rest of the culture will just kind of sink through the mesh. And what we did is we slowly heat, heated up the larvae and then we monitored how quickly they died or their mortality rate. Um, so essentially you go from having nice little larvae like this to ones that are just kind of splitting apart and dying. And then this is what we think of as our fitness proxy to thermal stress, so, not, so our mortality rate. So, um, just to remind you of the crossing design, anything that C or D is from PCB, so that warmer location on, in Australia, and AB is uh, Orchid Island, the cooler location. And this is what we see with mortality rate. So this is hours at 36 degrees centigrade, so we started counting at 24 hours, and this is slowly wrapping them up, and then um, all the way to 37 hours. And um, if you have an A or B first in your, in your family, you are from, or your mom was from Orpheus Island, and if you have a C or D, your mom was from um, Princess Charlotte Bay, and same thing goes for the dad. So the mom goes first, because ladies first. And what we see here is survival. So you'll see that already at 24 hours, some of the cultures already didn't have um, a full, the full 20 larvae left. So what we see is that um, these cultures that were from, that had Princess Charlotte Bay moms, did quite well up until the very end, and we see huge variation in how these uh, larvae died through time at, under different heat. So what this means, this were how much th um, difference was there? We think of this as fold increase in survival. So um, how much more likely were you to survive if your um, dad came from Princess Charlotte Bay? So the dad doesn't really give much more to the thermal tolerance in the larvae, but if your mom did, you're five times more likely to survive if your mom came from Princess Charlotte Bay. And then if both of your parents came from Princess Charlotte Bay, you see this additive effect where um, you see up to a tenfold increase in survival rate if um, both of your parents came from Princess Charlotte Bay. So what this means is that if you came from a warmer location, you were more thermally tolerant. So if your parents were hot, then you can deal with the hot weather as well. So. What this means for us as far as selection is that selection can in fact target thermal tolerance because it matters who your mom and dad are. This is a genetic effect. So we see that thermal tolerance is heritable and that so therefore selection can act on thermal tolerance genotypes. So essentially selection can target these, um, these thermal tolerant genotypes so that the next generation we can see more thermal tolerance. So how does heritable variation equal thermal tolerance? So in genetics, we think of this as being a genotype to the phenotype. So the genotype of your DNA codes for um, your phenotype that you're seeing. And the phenotype we're talking about here, again, is thermal tolerance. So just as a molecular biology intro, it's a lot more complicated than this, but essentially within the nucleus you have the DNA, and the DNA is transcri transcribed into RNA. And then the RNAs, of some of the introns are spliced out, and you get what's called the mRNA um, transferring out of the nucleus into the cytoplasm. And this is um, what we measure a lot. It's called gene expression. And then here you have your mRNA that's translated into protein, and the protein will manifest itself as a phenotype. So we have DNA to RNA to protein. Uh, the first part of this uh, genomic part is I'm going to talk about the RNA. So essentially I'm going to be talking about transcription, which is those segments of DNA that are copied into RNA and we, we call this gene expression. So what, what are the genes doing under these different conditions? So when we think about genotype to phenotype, we know our phenotype, um, we, I talked about the larval mortality. Uh, remember we saw this variation in how well you survived um, at 36 degrees depended on who your mom and dad were. Well, what we can look at now is the genotypes. What we did is we took the genotypes of larvae that were unstressed in control conditions across um, for every cross. And we took, this, we took these gene expression samples prior to measuring this larval mortality. So we took um, a subsection of the culture, froze it, and then we took the other subsection of the culture and measured this larval mortality. So we're able to look at how gene expression actually predicts the larval mortality. So the first thing we saw that was pretty exciting was that expression depends on your parents. So essentially there's genetic effects on gene expression. So these figures get kind of crazy to uh, look at, um, unless you're used to it. 
So what we have is each column is a single gene. We have 3,079 genes, and these are DEGs means differentially expressed genes. So we have 3,079 genes in our data set that had genetic effects, meaning it mattered who your mom and dad were. So again, the mom is the first letter and the dad is the second letter, and the color of the column is um, based on how much that gene, what that gene was doing. So if it's a warmer color, this kind of uh, yellow or brown color, we see that as being an upregulation. And if it's a cooler color, this um, kind of teal color, that means that gene was downregulated relative to the other samples. So you'll see that um, each row is actually a RNA seq sample, so a gene expression sample. So we'll, you see that we have three replicates of each of our crosses. So those were those three cultures I talked about earlier. So you'll see that each um, cross has three replicates. Um, and generally, as you're just kind of looking at the whole data set together, you kind of see these big swaths of genes that are kind of doing the same thing in um, reciprocal crosses. So when you have them C mom, D dad, D mom, C, C dad, you see that a lot of these genes here are turned off, and a lot of these genes here are turned on, and they're kind of doing the same thing. So what this means is that um, if you share the same mom or the same dad, you actually express these 3,079 genes similarly. So what about how it correlates with mortality? So um, like I said, these are genes that actually predict mortality, meaning that we took this gene expression before we measured mortality. So it's what these genes were doing in these crosses prior to measuring mortality. So if we look here, the y-axis here is the odds of survival. And this is just ranking our samples based on who died the most to who um, survived the most. And this is whether or not it's colored based on whether or not you had a PCB parent. You had none, so both of your parents came from Orpheus Island, your dad came from PCB, your mom came from PCB, or both of you came from PCB. So you can see again, we know that I've already showed you these data, but this is just kind of a different visualization that um, PCB parents generally did better than Orpheus Island. Um, under heat stress. When we look at the gene expression, um, we see 892 differentially expressed genes. This time each column is actually a sample and each row is a gene. And again, it's the same thing with the, um, the warmer tones being upregulated genes and the cooler tones being downregulated genes. But what we see is that there's a, there's a certain set of genes that are kind of upregulated um, prior to heat stress in these individuals that didn't do very well. And then these genes are kind of turning off as you get into the individuals that did better. And the same thing goes, there are certain genes that are turned off that are then turned on. So you see this kind of matrix of expression that shifts as you um, become more and more thermal tolerant. And I won't go into the, all of the statistics on it, but essentially thermal tolerant larvae, so these larvae over here that did a little bit better, actually lacked baseline expression of stress response genes, meaning that they just weren't very stressed to start off with. And then we also see that thermal tolerant larvae have expression changes of mitochondrial proteins. So mitochondria are coded for by your mom. So this means that it's a, um, a maternal effect, which isn't that surprising considering when we looked at the increase in survival, um, the mom did a lot more for um, survival than the dad did. And it was more of an um, additive effect when the dad was present. So we see um, more evidence here um, suggested by these differentially expressed mitochondrial proteins that the mom really plays a huge role here for thermal tolerance. And then, but that begs the question, how, how do we know that there are heritable DNA differences causing these RNA changes? So a lot of recent research has demonstrated that um, gene expression can actually become canalized during life, during life. So if you grow up in a certain environment, you just, you kind of become acclimated to that environment. So that's so you express like that because different genes become methylated. Um, there's all sorts of processes that lead to gene expression differences that aren't necessarily genetic. So I'm just going to blow up this uh, molecular biology 101 figure here. So now we're looking kind of on the side. On the side, so we have DNA that's being put into a primary RNA transcript. Then we have RNA processing control that takes you to a messenger RNA, and this is what's exported out of the nucleus. So this here all happens in the nucleus and it goes into the cytosol, and here we have mRNA, that's what we were previously looking at, and then we have um, being translated into protein. So we were looking here at the mRNA in all of these previous gene expression data, 
But now we're interested, okay, can this variation be selected on? Remember I said this, in order for selection to act, there, this variation needs to be coded for at the DNA level. So we're interested to know, um, yes, we see these differences in mRNA, but are these recapitulated at the DNA level, or is something else going on um, in, this, in these two areas here? So I'm going to introduce you to our casserole machines, this uh, highly sophisticated project. <laughs> so essentially, I told you we had these crosses. And what we did is we just took two of the crosses that we were um, interested in doing the casserole machine on. So we took the cross that had the mom C with the dad A and the mom A with the dad C. So we call this a reciprocal cross. So we shift who the mom and dad are. And then we bake them. So we take one group of the um, larvae and we keep them at control conditions and just leave them there. And then we take another group of larvae and we bake them and we look at who survives. So we fill each of these bins with thousands of larvae and then at the end we look at, you can't sequence who's dead, so the dead guys don't get sequenced, but you only sequence who's alive. So essentially we've created our own little selection experiment. Here we have our control where there is no heat applied and here we have thousands of larvae after the heat, only um, several hundred that survived, so this is our selected larvae. And then we can resequence 1% of the genome um, for the control and the heat and then compare um, what's going on. So what do I mean by resequencing the genome? Um, so all of this work was done by Gross, the primary author of the paper, but essentially as you uh, isolate the DNA from your larvae, and we did this for each individual larvae, and then we use restriction enzymes to actually cut up the DNA. So it's not done like this. Unfortunately, DNA is not so big and easy to work with. Um, so you do it all in tiny tubes, but I like this picture. Uh, so you essentially cut across the DNA and it will cut. It has these restriction cut sites that will cut in equal areas across the whole genome. And then it cuts your DNA into all these little pieces, and then we sequence that. Um, so we sequence this with Illumina. And then we actually can map these small little little bits of DNA back onto the Acropora millipora genome. So there's a genome available, like I told you, so this is a nice resource for us to use. And then we're able to identify single nucleotide polymorphisms, essentially small changes at the ge genetic level that may code for um, differences in genes or um, areas under selection in the genome, and, they, and they're given some sort of significant score. If you're really interested in the statistics behind this, I highly recommend you read through our supplemental information, which is quite extensive. Um, but essentially, it's given some sort of p-value. And then if you imagine taking each of these chromosomes and laying them flat, and then looking, as you go along the uh, chromosome, looking at what's happening at each locus, each individual tag that you've measured here, it looks something like this. So here you have the negative log of the p-value, which is the significant score I talked about. And here you have, in each, each of these colors represents a different chromosome. So you're kind of stretching out each of the chromosomes and looking at what each um, little tag is doing, each of these little pieces of DNA is doing um, in the heat relative to the control. So if you have a lot of uh, these polymorphisms between your heat and your control, you're going to get situations like this, these strong peaks that are signatures of selection in the genome. So as we're walking along the genome here, we see a peak, boom. So that means that that area of the genome is, statistically um, speaking, is under selection. It's positively selected for. As we go through again, we see this other peak, something like this. And this situation, this is a human, um, but we are going to be looking at the coral. So for the next slide, we can, oh, and then we can also ask, what are the genes that are under this peak? So what genes might be under selection in the genome? So once you identify these peaks, you can go back to your genome and ask, what genes are present here? So what we see are that different areas of the genome are under selection at each cross. So remember again, this is the CA cross. So this is your mom came from PCB and your dad came from Orpheus Island. And this is the heat versus control. And, and this is our locked P value. So as you get higher, it means you're actually more significant since it's a negative log. And corals have 14 chromosomes. So we're just stretching out each of our chromosomes here and looking for um, small loci that might be under selection, and what we're looking for are peaks like this. That regardless of the statistical test we use, we detect these strong peaks here. And what that means is that this area of the genome is under selection in this cross for heat versus control. So there's something under this peak that's controlling those larvae that were able to survive that, 
thermal, uh, thermal stress in the casserole machine. Interestingly, when we look at the opposite cross, so we're looking at the AC cross here, so this again is our Orpheus Island um, mom with the um, dad from PCB, what we see is a different, on a completely different chromosome, chromosome 5, we see a, str a strong signal of selection here. Um, so this again is the dad from Orcas Island and this is the mom from PCB, but essentially what we see when we actually look under the peaks uh, are that the proteins that are coded for under the peaks of this uh, chromosome 10 are actually mitochondria, so again inherited from your mom. So in, if you inherit mitochondrial genes from your mom, they're important for thermal tolerance. So now we can ask the question, is genetic rescue actually possible? So one thing I didn't tell you about is that these corals, that larval stage I told you about that they, where they can spend days to months in the water column, they're actually highly dispersive. They move around with the currents. And what this means is that um, corals are able to disperse actually quite far distances. So it's not unrealistic to imagine that a Princess Charlotte Bay coral larvae could make it to Orpheus Island or that an Orpheus Island larvae could make it to Princess Charlotte Bay. And this work has been done on the Great Barrier Reef for this species, and we do know that there's a lot of mixture that goes along the reef. So um, there's a lot of sharing of genes across the reef, um, just neutrally. We also know that if you, if you had a PCB parent, so if your parent came from this warmer location, we see an increased thermal tolerance, up to tenfold. Um, and this is especially for if your mom came from PCB. Secondly, we see that PCB larvae are less stressed than Orpheus Island larvae, so in general, um, PCB larvae are just less stressed as far as gene expression goes. Secondly, for gene expression, we see that expression correlates with larval mortality, and uh, this is generally mitochondrial genes, so again, these maternal genes that may be important for mortality under heat stress. And at the DNA level, we see that the DNA codes for tolerance, and in the cross with the PCB mom, we see mitochondrial genes being selected for. So overall, what we think this means is that the genetic rescue scenario might be a plausible mechanism for rapid coral adaptation to climate change, especially given the natural connectivity of corals. So what this means is that we found a genetic effect of thermal tolerance. We know corals can move long distances, so what we think is that these larvae from Princess Charlotte Bay may be able to rescue Orpheus Island under a um, severe bleaching scenario. So I just want to quickly tell you about what, I've, um, what I'm kind of up to these days. Um, I've moved labs, so I'm now at the University of North Carolina. I have a collaboration, so what, I have three bosses, essentially. I've got Carl Castillo, he's here at University of Chapel Hill, and I've got Adrian Marchetti, he's also here at UNC, and then I've got Justin Reese, and he's up at Northeastern. So what we're kind of trying to get at um, in our current research is what the underlying physiological responses are to increase heat surface temperature as well as ocean acidification. Do we see some sort of acclimatization or fitness reduction? Um, so I'm sure you guys already all know this, but um, sea surface temperature increases are not the only factors that are influence, influencing corals. What we're also seeing is a reduction in pH across the world, across the world, world's ocean. So this is a change in sea surface pH. Um, this is the 1700s to 1990s, and you can see that a lot of the ocean is becoming more and more acidic. Um, and this is some work from work from 2010. So what we're doing is we have this, uh, we just started this big experiment up at Northeastern and we're uh, culturing uh, adult corals at two different temperatures, their mean temperature on the reef, 28 degrees, and a maximum, 31. And we have four PCO2 conditions, or acidification conditions, 280, which represents pre-industrial, 400, which represents today, 700, which which is predicted next century, and 2800, which is Cretaceous. We have three tanks for treatment, so 24 tanks. And uh, this is Belize, this is, uh, so Carl Castillo is actually from Belize, so we do a lot of our work there. And when we zoom in, we go out of this Punta Gorda and head out to uh, these reefs here. So we have two reefs, we have the near shore reefs and the more four reef uh, corals. And we've collected two species. So we have Sideraster Sideria, this is kind of um, becoming a super resilient coral. It doesn't really seem to be affected much by thermal, thermal stress or pH stress or pretty much any stressor. And this is Pseudodiploria strigosa. It's a very common coral across the reef environment. And our experimental design is essentially we have these two locations near Shone 4 Reef. Um, we collected three large colonies of Sideraster sideria and three 
Oh, sorry. Yeah, at four reef and then three near shore. And then the same thing for Pseudodiploria strigosa. And then we have four time points. So essentially, um, four nubbins of each individual will go into each of my experimental tanks. And I'm taking four time points. I'll have a T0, T30, T60, T90. And at each of these time points, I'm interested in understanding what's happening physiologically. So I'm going to be looking at lipids, proteins, carbohydrates. What's happening to their symbionts? Are they bleaching? Or are they increasing their symbiont density? I'll be looking at symbiodinium efficiency, so FB over FM. And I'll be looking at calcification, so how fast these corals are growing or how slow they're growing. And I'll be, and then I'll be correlating all of these physiological measurements uh, with gene expression. So that's kind of where I'm going next. Um, more interested in within generation acclimatization, so how corals are able, if they are able to um, acclimatize to these changing conditions. Um, this is what our experimental setup looks like. So we've got this really awesome system up at Northeastern. The ones with the bright lights are our corals inside of the each of the tanks is uh, 32 nubbins. Um, so it's a pretty hardcore experiment. We're going out for the first weigh-in on it's like Biggest Loser. <laughs> We're going out for the coral weigh-in on in August, and that will be the start of our experiment. So pretty excited. So with that, that is the end of my presentation. So with that, I'll take any questions. And I'm not sure how that works. But yeah. Sarah, this is Jeff Burgett. Um, I'm out at the Pacific Islands Climate Change Cooperative. Just on that last um, experimental design that you're setting up, the Cretaceous um, uh, treatment, um, so that's going to be PCO2 at, at Cretaceous levels, but with the pH uh, not, I mean, is it, are you buffering that one? Because during the Cretaceous, of course, the, the PCO2 change happened so slowly that you actually had um, uh, ocean pH at, at essentially like eight point something or other. So are you controlling for that? Uh, no, we're just tra we're just controlling the PCO2 levels in these tanks. So we're trying to, what we saw, I'm not sure if you read Carl's paper that came out last year, but we saw this kind of parabolic response and we see it for temperature and um, pH, so, or PCO2. So one of our goals is to try to recapitulate that with a second species to see if we observe this parabolic response. Um, and we're more interested in the mechanisms that corals might use to um, kind of buffer PCO2 differences. So um, it's not necessarily to, necessarily to try to put corals in Cretaceous level conditions overall. It's just like, so they'll be the same levels everything except for PCO2, except for if they're in the different temperatures. So they'll be 28 degrees with uh, Cretaceous. PCO2 and 31 degrees with Cretaceous PCO2. Yeah. yeah, I just I would just caution you not to call it Cretaceous conditions because that wouldn't be correct. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Well, if if nobody's going to ask, um, this is Jeff Murgan again. So your genetic rescue um, depends on their, on a couple things, the dispersal obviously, and also a population that's had some um, experience and selective pressure of those higher temperatures. What do you think is likely to happen when those corals are get experiencing temperatures above their thermal tolerance range? You know, how yeah, far can you go? Yeah, that's a really good question. So one of the things that we haven't published yet, but um, it will be coming out hopefully soon, is that we actually see the same sort of, um, like not the, um, it's within a reef. So we've done the same experiment within Orpheus Island. And actually within a single reef, we actually do see quite a bit of additive genetic variation for thermal tolerance. So um, I think there is a lot of variation to select on within a population as well. So, um, but yeah, it's definitely not like we can push them forever. Um, but I think that there is a lot more variation 
within a reef and between reefs that we aren't really considering when we're considering these scenarios for coral. Okay, and you're, you're, so you planually don't actually have any symbionts, correct? Correct, yeah, they're, they're symbiont free. Okay, so, I mean, there's been a lot of work done with, with um, symbiont clades and the, the diversity of clades within colonies and species. Um, how can you kind of relate these two studies, that study, those kind of studies with the study you have? Well, I think what we're seeing is that there's a lot of mechanisms for corals to deal with a changing climate. One of them can just be the coral host itself, so the idea that selection can act on the coral host independently. But we also see the interaction when a coral has certain symbiodinium types that may do better or worse. So I think that we're just kind of seeing multiple mechanisms that allow corals to deal with thermal tolerance. So, um, but it's again, there's trade-offs for all of this. So, for example, we see that you know, for some of the research has shown that certain symbiodinium clades, you know, you do you're more thermal tolerant, but then you have costs associated with like growth reductions and things like that, maybe reproductive output. So it's not that we're um, there may be some cost to being thermal tolerant that we. Like, we didn't look at that in our study, but I know people are looking at that sort of thing. Like, are there costs associated with being thermally tolerant? So I think that the symbiodinium work kind of just um, is complementary. It's, so it's just another way corals can, like, if they can shuffle their symbionts and bring in more of D or a more thermal tolerant C, um, or I think actually even just the mechanism of dispersal for corals and for establishing their symbiosis. So for in these corals, they do horizontal transmission. So when they arrive to a reef, they grab their symbiont from the local environment. So that could also be a way to kind of get a leg up when you arrive. So you grab the symbiont that's been, you know, locally selected on, um, and then you're like extra, maybe. But I mean, I, no one's shown that. But I think it could be, I think there's several ways, and I don't think they're mutually exclusive for corals to deal with climate change. All right, thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. Sarah, this is Bill Sikufner again. I have a question for you. Um, what, what do you feel, um, what are your thoughts on the contribu controversial issue of assisted migration? In other words, like taking um, tourist straight corals and putting them at uh, other places where it's been degraded and you know, possibly even Opera to the Caribbean, things like that. Yeah, I, I feel, I feel very cautious about these sorts of things. I think that a lot of research has shown that corals are locally adapted at the adult stage. So, whether that's canalization from your habitat or if that is like, you know, ad adaptation, like the corals are locally adapted to their environment, um, you know, it's hard to test. But I think we have to be really careful when we're thinking about moving adult corals across habitats, you know, I moved to Texas from Canada and it was really hard <laughs> to deal with the temperatures. So I think it's like, yes, it's maybe a possibility, but I would really caution it because I think that, you know, these corals are used to their environment that they live in. We dealt, we were doing all of our work on larvae. Um, we did do some heat stress experiments on the adults as well, which is in the paper. I didn't discuss today, but um, as far as moving corals, I think that there is a lot of evidence that coral populations are locally adapted. So I think that if you're moving adult corals, you need to be really careful because if you're moving a coral from an environment, from its favorite environment, its environment it grew up in where it's doing well, and then you're putting it into a new environment, it's gonna be challenging. So they may not do very well. And I think that's that's my feeling. I would not I would want to do lots of pilot work before it was ever a big production for sure. <laughs> 